Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, many of you know I've been here on sabbatical for this academic year, and uh, this this talk probably wouldn't be uh, given had I not been here because this uh, work actually was done in the fall and it was very much prompted uh, by a discussion that began at T. There was an article uh, in the fall about how T T time stimulates discussions, and this was uh, an example of that. I started talking with Tom Spencer and Roland Bauerschmidt, and uh, got me thinking about some something I used to be doing. So here it is, and uh, I wrote up a short paper which just appeared in PRL yesterday. So great timing. As the stringent refereeing process. <laughs> um, okay, so so the uh, in some sense this line of work began back uh, eight years ago, um, and uh, and there were three papers back then, and then there were some issues to be clarified that were in this paper, uh, and then this is the individual short paper that. I recently wrote, and this started with a, a discussion of something very retro, which is the Owen symmetric scalar field theory. Uh, you would think, what what new can be done about Owen symmetric scalar field theory? Uh, but it turns out that something slightly new was being done, and uh, I'll spend a good part of my talk actually talking about that. Uh, that work. Uh, and also there is another purpose to this talk, which is, uh, which I will mention in, in a couple of slides. But let me just talk about the ON model, uh, just a textbook example of quantum field theory. It's discussed at length in Peskin and Schroeder, for example. Uh, here I'm omitting the mass term, which is of course also unsymmetric, but we of course tune the mass to zero at the second order phase transition. And then we're left with this uh, vortic interaction phi i phi i squared. Uh, and uh, this describes the second order phase transition in ON magnets, for example, in three dimensions. Here I'm leaving the dimensionality arbitrary for now because it will play a big role, uh, the dimensional continuation. But just the physical significance of this model is of course, the n equal one case is the Z2 or easing universality class. Uh, and then there is the O21, which describes known uh, superconducting phase transitions. And then there is the Heisenberg, Heisenberg class and so on. So this is definitely relevant to real world, uh, but it, it is a strongly coupled uh, uh, formal field theory. So how do we study it? Uh, well, the, there are various ways to approximate it. One is the Wilson Fisher 4 minus epsilon expansion. It was actually uh, so one of the other purposes of my talk is it's a, a golden jubilee of the Wilson Fisher paper. That paper came out on January 24, 1972. And since then, we've been doing epsilon expansions of all kinds. And you'll see that epsilon expansions will play a big role for me. So there is this uh, Wilson Fisher 4 minus epsilon. Then the, there is a 2 plus epsilon expansion for the ON nonlinear sigma model. Uh, then one over n expansion, which also began in the long ago, at least in the 60s or 50s even. And more recently, there have been numerical conformal bootstrap studies of this. Or an universality class, which provides a totally different numerical set of constraints, which are very precise on the uh, on the operator dimensions of the CFT. Uh, so this is actually copied this uh, historic Wilson Fisher paper, um, critical exponents in three point ninety nine dimensions, uh, and. Uh, and there was actually, I wasn't the only one aware that it's been 50 years because uh, exactly on January 24, uh, 2022, there was an extensive review by uh, Johan Henriksson, 
uh, called Critical ONCFT, which has a, an excellent compendium of all kinds of facts and expansions <laughs> about these models. So it's a very good resource. And this is, I think, the first paper where you could see things like D equal four minus epsilon. And actually, I learned recently that sadly Michael Fisher passed away in the fall. Uh, so he, of course, played an amazing role in this field. Okay, so uh, so let, uh, let me continue with the review. So how is four minus epsilon expansion developed for this quartic theory? Uh, well, we all know that the one loop beta function has this term minus epsilon lambda because uh, essentially the five four interaction becomes very slightly, it's marginal in uh, four dimensions and it's very slightly relevant in four minus epsilon dimension. And this is just a standard one loop beta function uh, for the ON uh, symmetric field theory. It has this N plus A. Uh, and actually, if you read the, the famous uh, Wilson Cogat review, they interpret the presence of this H shift as, uh, as indicating that, uh, that the one over N expansion will not be great for N below A and which actually turns out to be precisely the case. The one over n expansion in d equals three uh, is numerically just very poor uh, for n equal one and two, where we're most interested in it, but it becomes uh, nice for 10 and higher. And this is very much demonstrated by the recent conformal bootstrap results. So, so the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, uh, IR stable fixed point occurs at where you set this beta function to zero, you get lambda star, which is epsilon over n plus eight. And this allows us to perform expansions of the scaling dimensions. Uh, so delta phi, for example, the, the anomalous dimension here is only of order epsilon squared, but for operator phi squared, it enters already at order epsilon. So this was the beginning of this, uh, this big uh, epsilon revolution. Uh, so now uh, one, one can actually an excellent resource is a book by uh, uh, by Kleinert and Schulte Frohlinde where these expansions were done up to five loops and more recently amazingly there are six six loop formula of course the coefficients start getting quite big so there is this company it's an answer paper from 2017 and this has been subjected to all kinds of tests and I wouldn't be surprised if the seven loop will come out soon. Uh, so in fact, uh, one of the things that I'll say is like one of the side products of what I'll be saying is some additional tests on consistency of all these different formula. Are there any questions? Uh, feel free to interrupt. Uh, yeah, so far it's been all like very familiar subject. Uh, then there is a uh, comment. Mm -hmm. Looking at those numbers, Wilson and Fisher were brave to be optimistic it was useful that epsilon equals one because the order epsilon contribution is rather big for delta phi and delta phi squared. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, so this term here is just the three dimension. Oh, I see, I see. Right. So that is the epsilon squared. But this turns out to be very That's small. Actually, Thank you. so so the one accidental thing is that even for n equal one, this is small, yeah. and the epsilon cube term for uh, for epsilon equal one has exactly the same value. And to get, uh, so the the order of magnitude, so this in d equal three gives 0.5. Uh, this pushes it to 0.51, and this pushes it to 0.52 which is extremely close to the actual dimension, which is 0.518. So, so it was a lucky case in a sense, uh, but for other models, of course, it doesn't have to be this lucky, but, uh, but then there are various resummations that one can do and so on. Okay, so then there is a story. So what, suppose we consider negative coupling. This is actually also part of the history of quantum field theory because Kurt Semancic uh, already in 1972 was apparently looking for an asymptotically free theory. And an example he came, came up with 
is negative lambda phi four theory, the upside down phi four theory. So if you look at this formula and you change lambda to minus lambda, the sign of this one loop term will change. And he actually wrote a beautiful paper in the fall of 1972, working out the asymptotic freedom formula for this theory that we're now very familiar with in the context of non-abelian theory. Uh, and then this uh, actually enables people to formally proceed to four plus epsilon, because there there will be a UV fixed point. But the theory above four dimensions is, of course, already non-renormalizable. So this is a little bit formal. But still, there was a lot of work on what happens in, for this uh, negative coupling. Uh, lambda is again will be very small, so it's only very slightly unstable kind of in four plus epsilon dimensions. And one paper which, uh, so this took many years for me and Simone Jombi and uh, other collaborators, Tarnopolsky, to, uh, to figure out what was going on back in the 70s. But there was a notable paper by McCain, Wallace, and Alcantara on team which pointed out that this instability manifests itself through the instant on effect, which make the scaling dimensions acquire small imaginary parts, but they're really exponentially small. They're doubly suppressed by n and one over epsilon. Uh, but it's, it's a very nice paper, which uh, I will mention again in another context. So this, this uh, negative lambda theory is a bit of a different world. You, we all know that the upper critical dimension of the usual ON magnets is four, and this is something else. Somehow it's disconnected from that. Is, is the point that the theory is not renormalizable, but the first counter term will appear at four dimensions? Yeah, the, so one interesting thing about this particular theory is that uh, people say that the one over N expansion nevertheless is well defined, even though in the usual power counting way, it's not renormalizable you can still handle one over n expansion. And there were papers on this by Parisi, by like gross Nevu model is in the same spirit. But what I will actually do is I will make this theory renormalizable. I will show how to UV complete this slightly unstable theory. That, that is sort of the main on the scalar. Right, by adding a, an additional scalar there. So, so it's a bit formal and you certainly can't be fully satisfied with it, but, but one can still choose to take it seriously. And uh, uh, okay, so the large end treatment, which I already started talking about, that's of course very important. And the big reason I got into thinking about this uh, stuff from long ago is because with Polyakov about 20 years ago already, we proposed that the ON model has a dual description through ADS CFT duality using higher spin theory in ADS D plus one. So let me just remind you how the one over N expansion of the CFT works. This dates back to papers again from the 60s and early 70s. One essentially because the interaction has the form of trace trace or trace squared, one can just add this auxiliary field sigma and, uh, and then uh, integrate over it. And initially it has no dynamics, right? So if you just integrate out the sigma, you will get this phi, phi to the four double trace interaction. Uh, and then what happens is, uh, so there were very clever papers on how to develop one over an expansion in continuous D. It's, you, you're not just tied to D equals three. You can really do it, say, between two and four dimensions uh, and work out all the dimension dependencies. Essentially, you, uh, you have this induced dynamics for this sigma field, which comes from the two-point function of phi squared. And if you go to momentum space, you see that the sigma sigma uh, two-point function has this power loss structure, P squared to some number. Uh, and we see that for D below four, this at low momenta actually dominates over this initial constant term. So you can just drop this term formally 
and uh, had used this induced dynamics for the sigma field. Uh, and, the, and this allows us to perform by attaching the sigma uh, lines, you can develop one over n expansion. And this was done to, this is a whole different way of doing calculations because you have, for example, one over n term as a function of d. I will display it in a second. Uh, so, so this delta phi, there is a free, free field term plus there is one over n times some function of d plus one over n squared times another function and so on. And already the one over n cube term was derived in the 70s by a group from uh, Leningrad, uh, then uh, Vasiliev at all. Uh, and it, already, it contains some uh, complicated functions, but it's perfectly user friendly. And then it can be expanded, for example, in four minus epsilon to any order. So that formula provides information about arbitrarily high loops in the usual epsilon expansion. That's, that's the miracle of these type of formula. And they serve as checks of what goes on with these six loop and seven loop and so on, because those you can then isolate, say the one over n, one over n squared and one over n cubed term and check that they agree with these known formula. So for example, eta one, the, this uh, leading term is very well known and it just contains these, uh, these gamma functions, but then it gets a little uh, more complicated than this. So let's just look at this formula, which has been known, I think since the early seventies. Uh, and then uh, let's just plug this formula. So you would say that whenever this eta one goes negative, the large end theory will automatically be below the unitarity bound which is d over two minus one. And then if you plot it, you notice that it's, po it's certainly positive between two and four as it should, but then it's also positive between four and six, and then finally goes negative above six dimensions. So this kind of attracts uh, some attention to, uh, to this region for d between four and six. And we noticed this in our very first paper by Lin Fei, a grad student at the time, Zhao Bi and me. And then later we learned that this special range was pointed out in a paper by Parisi from 1975. Uh, and then similarly, the, the coefficient of the two-point function, the C tilde sigma can also be computed and it also exhibits similar features. It goes negative above six, but it stays positive between four and six. So basically what we're learning is that even though the theory is uh, uh, a bit strange, but at least in the sense of one over n expansion, it may be nice and unitary. And that was, I think, the point the guess also made in the 70s. Okay, so this stuff I already mentioned. So let's just suppose we try to think harder about the theory between four and six dimensions, which was one over n expansion we in principle already know to a pretty high order. Uh, so one way to think about it is this four plus epsilon expansion, but that's not renormalizable, it's strange and so on. Uh, but so we, what we came up with back eight years ago was, uh, uh, a renormalizable theory which describes the same physics. And, and uh, it's a six, uh, so it's a cubic theory which has exactly the same symmetries. So this is kind of the main formula of the first part of the talk that we add the uh, sigma uh, field as a dynamical field. And then the two ON invariant renormalizable interactions in six dimensions will be six phi phi and sigma phi phi and sigma q, right? Uh, that's basically the only thing it can be. And another reason why you think that this, so this sigma field is a bit like the sigma field we already see here. Uh, but it's sort of something very special happens to the sigma field near six dimensions. It, because its scaling dimension is always two, it just becomes very near six dimensions, just the standard Gaussian field with the canonical K 
genetic term. So we knew from this larger treatment that its dimension is two, and two is, of course, the dimension of um, the dimension of free field in six dimensions. So that's basically the reason why this all makes uh, some amount of sense. So this is the only thing that we could write down. And this theory is, of course, renormalizable, albeit unstable, everywhere below six dimensions. So we started developing, started thinking about the IR fixed points of this renormalizable theory in six minus epsilon, and uh, we found some amusing things. So, so for example, if you uh, just compute the one loop beta functions, you find that at large n there are indeed uh, there is an IR stable fixed point at real couplings at large n, which has this value of G1 and G2 is just six G1. And the fact that this has a one over square root of n is sort of makes it agree with the one over n expansion. Uh, but, uh, but it turns out that this fixed point disappears. It only exists for n bigger than 1039. So it's a very strange and large value of n required to make it work. So sometimes we say uh, large n may be good down to n equal three. Well, in this theory, the large n expansion is only good down to around 1040, and then it somehow breaks down. But this is just a one loop statement, and it gets, it seems to get corrected rather significantly. So here, this picture of RG flows, you see this IR fixed point and the physically equivalent IR fixed point at fluid couplings. These two are really completely physically equivalent. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, so what we started doing is comparing the, this epsilon expansion with the expansion of these, uh, these type of one over n formula near six minus epsilon, and we found always agreement. In other words, it, it passes the same kind of check that the four minus epsilon expansion always passed to arbitrarily high loop order. Namely, if we, uh, so let me just show you a bit more precisely what I mean. So for example, you can, we then did the three loop calculations. And since then, uh, Racy did the four loop one and even the five loop one is also known. So this formula gets very long, but you can develop these kind of expansions uh, to order, for example, epsilon cube. You know these one over n coefficients, one over n squared, one over n cube. Then you take these formula from known since the 70s for the one over n, expand them in six minus epsilon, and all these coefficients are going to agree this, uh, say 1936 epsilon minus 16,352 epsilon squared and so on, and even the zeta of three, it all agrees. So it uh, basically shows that this theory is basically a sensible formal continuation of the ON model to, to this region uh, near six dimensions, uh, albeit one has to be careful with its interpretation. Uh, and the same is true for the scaling dimension of the sigma field. In this model, what we call sigma, it should really be compared with the phi i, phi i in the original quartic formulation. And it works. But of course, uh, there is some, uh, the theory cannot be just a standard CFT. And in fact, uh, there is, uh, it's not catastrophically unstable, but it turns out that it's metastable in a similar way to what was discovered in four plus epsilon dimension, namely, uh, uh, namely, if you so, why is it metastable? Because when you compute scaling dimensions, you really put it on uh, on the cylinder r times s d minus one, and the curvature coupling uh, of the the sigma field will actually provide a sort of right side up coupling. 
So there will be some right side up sigma square term and then sigma cube, but it takes some tunneling to go to the unstable region. And so uh, somewhere before the pandemic with uh, Silvio and uh, Silvio Kufu and John P. Huang and Tarnakowski, we started doing a more detailed study of these imaginary parts of scaling dimensions uh, and the instant count in the theory and found actually a formula valid for any D uh, for the order of magnitude of these imaginary parts. And it has very interesting connection to the uh, free energy of a conformal scalar on S D minus two. We basically know this explicitly what the order of magnitude here is. And this allows us to estimate the rate of how big these imaginary parts are expected to be. Of course, if you make n large enough, you can suppress them by a lot uh, numerically. Uh, so we know that in five dimensions, the coefficient will be quite small. Uh, this is the number very well known to those of us who like to work on around three sphere. This is just the most basic number on around three sphere. It's about six uh, hundreds. So here I plotted this f of d, and you see that it blows up both in six minus epsilon and in four plus epsilon, which provides additional suppression of these imaginary parts. Uh, but in five, it's like one of the hardest things. Of course, we were hoping sort of to get some sort of interesting theory in five dimensions, but it turns out that for n around five, uh, for around 500, the imaginary parts are already very small of the order of 10 to the minus 14. And, uh, uh, and there, so people have actually done bootstrap on this model, including Shai Chester and Silvio. And then there was a paper a few years ago by Lee and Sue, who working in D equal five for 500 actually observed these nice islands. Uh, for this particular model, this is the plot of delta sigma uh, delta phi. So they boldly applied bootstrap here and they found these shrinking islands right around the value that you would infer from the one over n expansion for scaling dimension. So here the situation is rather similar to the successes that we saw for the ON model in D equal three. And you would think that things might be just as good, but of course, this is much less investigated. Uh, so, so the upshot is that the theory is not exactly critical, but it's in some sense very close to being critical with, uh, it's a little bit like these complex CFTs that uh, Slava Rchko and Bernardo and Victor Verbenko worked on, but at the same time, a bit different because the imaginary parts come from a non-perturbative mechanism and can be very strongly suppressed at sufficiently large end. So what the value is, of n is this plot? Uh, this is for n equal 500. Ah. Yeah, certainly. So ideally you would say, what does this really tell us about, uh, suppose someone is bold enough to put five dimensional spin simulations Right, on the lattice and look for critical behavior. Well, n equal 500 makes it a little hard to <laughs> because you need these spins living on the, uh, you know, on the 500 dimensional sphere. But in principle, uh, yeah, one thing that I think would be nice to do is to do it even for slightly bigger and just to check that these because then the one over n expansions get even better. Just to check if this uh, agreement between bootstrap and perturbative one over n will even improve. So there is certainly space uh, for improvement here. And, uh, and then the question is, what precisely does it mean for, uh, I, yes? But, but this is not a unitary theory though, right? Or is Right, so it's funny. So it's perturbatively unitary. It's uh, unitary in the sense of one over n expansion. But for all correlators or, or just 
for all correlators, if you ignore these e to the minus n effects, it's unitary. What breaks the unitarity? It's different from, I will in a second talk about another non-unitary theory where, which is of the kind we're more used to, which is uh, like Li Yang edge singularity. There, the scaling exponents are all real, but they're just below the, they're too negative or not positive enough. <laughs> so it's a very different beast. I, I was going to call it more like, rather than non-unitary CFT, I was going to call it a metastable CFT or something like that. But it's not totally clear in my mind what precisely it implies for, uh, for if you were to do, say, a Monte Carlo study of a spin system. Here, I think Monte Carlo study doesn't seem feasible, but maybe something similar can be found for a simpler theory where you can make imaginary parts very, very tiny. The bootstrap, I think it has only so much numerical precision. So if you make imaginary parts, say order 10 to the minus 20, the bootstrap will boldly discover this. Uh, it will not exclude this theory. And this is, I think, what we're seeing here. Right, right. So I, I guess, I guess the, the bootstrap on here on, on the right was, was done under the assumption that the scaling dimensions are real. Yeah, yeah. The, it's a unitary bootstrap. It's not a Gliotzi bootstrap. It's a perfectly unitary version of bootstrap. Uh, and the results were rather similar to what people discovered in the equal three ON model with the difference that there they were working for N of order 10 and here you need N in the hundreds. And that we already saw from just the structure of coefficients and the one of our N expansion. So there still is a chance that if you increase the uh, accuracy of the uh, bootstrap, then the island might just disappear. Yeah, that, that's actually, so there is definitely more room for investigating numerically. Yeah, maybe these uh, islands will just completely disappear if you. But they, they did this also for n equal 100, and that's exactly what they saw. I see. That there was an island first, and then they increased the precision, and then the island disappeared. I see. Mm -hmm. So it, it may happen here. OK, so now this, uh, this is just sort of fun and games with uh, ON models. But then let me switch to this prompted us to think about a slightly different model, which is uh, much similar to uh, more similar to what Tom was uh, bringing up, and uh, it goes back actually to so original interest in six minus epsilon expansion was due to the paper by Michael Fisher, which I, went, I already mentioned it briefly, where he just took a single scalar field with a cubic coupling uh, and found that there is an IR fixed point at imaginary coupling there. And the idea is that if you continue that theory to two dimensions, you get the Li Yang uh, uh, theory in 2D. Uh, but that, that model also makes sense uh, in 5D, 4D, and 3D. And it describes things like lattice animals and so on. Uh, so the reason that theory is, is stable is because the path integral is not is of the form e to the i phi q. And then just it oscillates very rapidly, but there is no instability. And we, we actually found the, uh, new theories of this sort uh, back in 14, 15. So what we did is we, in some sense, took this ON model and tried to continue to negative N, uh, which means we replaced the N commuting scalars by two M anti-commuting ones, or M pairs of anti-commuting ones with SP to M symmetry. So this is another cubic theory in six dimensions, which has this, this structure. Uh, okay, and it obviously has this SP to M symmetry acting on these pairs of uh, Grassmann fields. Uh, the beta functions perturbatively are very simple to extract. You just plug in N, uh, N replace it by minus 2M, and, and there you go. And here there were actually, for any M, there were 
IR stable fixed points at imaginary values of coupling, similar to what Michael Fisher stuff. So these describe like, I would say healthy non-unitary theories, and these can be certainly compared to lattice, actual lattice systems and so on. Uh, uh, and then the, the pleasant surprise was the following, that when we looked at the very simplest model with just one pair, theta and theta bar, this cubic model, we found something special happening at the IR fixed point. Namely, the symmetry was enhanced from just SP2 to OSP12, to a supergroup symmetry. And the, the hint of that, we when we computed the Scaling dimensions, they were exactly uh, have had a ratio of two. So, so these two uh, cubic interaction terms combine to something amazing, which is an OSP12 invariant term, sigma squared plus two theta theta bar to the three halves power. Because the expansion in theta theta bar terminates, uh, you basically find uh, find that these two cubic terms can combine into something like this, and this happens. So, so we have this OSB12 invariant uh, fix, uh, fixed point. Okay, and then we, uh, so at the time already, there was some very interesting work uh, available by uh, Caracciolo et al. Um, and we, so we're trying to compare, they had an OSP12 invariant two-dimensional theory. So I'll mention a bit more about this, but, but the crucial thing here is that these Gs are both imaginary. So as I mentioned already, uh, so the scaling dimensions are equal to each other and one can develop their six minus epsilon expansion. So in six dimensions, these are like scalar fields of so dimension two, and then there are various corrections. Okay, so, uh, but for M bigger than one, we didn't find any symmetry enhancement. And this is related to the fact that if you try to write down the three halves power of sigma squared plus theta theta bar, you will find terms containing one over sigma. So it cannot appear in the standard field theory. That this is what I'm, basically what I realized uh, uh, in November after talking to Tom and Roland. This is sort of the reason why we could not possibly get this OSP14 invariant cubic theory. And then indeed for M bigger than one, we found that delta sigma is not equal to delta theta. And we, I'm not sure what the interpretation of these, uh, these type of cu cubic theories in particular, what is their lower critical dimension and so on. But for the case, uh, for this OSP12 case, I think it's understood quite well how to describe them near two dimensions. And that uh, two dimensions is that their lower critical dimension. Basically, if you continue this theory to two dimensions, uh, you, you find a, a sigma model with target space uh, H02, which is a fermion anti commutative anti-commuting version of the hyperbolic space. Uh, and that's related to the work by Caracho et al. But they were always thinking about, tended to think about the S02, namely a sphere, uh, while uh, Bauerschmidt et al. Uh, said that it should be hyperboloid. And in fact, the symmetries of this, this uh, hyperbolic sigma model I mean, it differs by Z2. And uh, the symmetries, as far as I can tell, exactly the same as the symmetries of this cubic theory that, uh, that is written down here, this, this cubic theory. So the proposal, therefore, is that, uh, so if you pick the solution in two plus epsilon dimensions, say uh, sigma, just pick one of the solutions of the constraint, that's how you define this hyperbolic sigma model. And, uh, and it is asymptotically free for G squared less than zero. And that's the regime that we want to be in, this G squared. We certainly want to be in the asymptotically free regime so that in two dimensions, the model generates the mass. 
but in two plus epsilon, there is a weakly coupled UV fixed point formally. Uh, and the this G squared less than zero is kind of crucially related to the fact that we're finding imaginary G in six minus epsilon dimension. So, so this picture seems like a consistent picture. What happens with this OSP12 universality class between two and six dimensions? And uh, so perturbatively, you can develop both the two plus epsilon expansion. Oops. Uh, two plus epsilon expansion uh, using the known formula by Brezen and Zinjustan, and also have the six minus epsilon expansion. And there is like a simple technique to develop uh, but the approximants that match both two plus epsilon and six minus epsilon. And you get some set of numbers for these dimensions. They are all non-unitary, namely they're all below what would be the unitarity bound, but perfectly real. The remarkable thing about these numbers is that they agree very well with Monte Carlo uh, results by Deng, Aroni, and Falcao, uh, which I'll mention in a second. Maybe. What is the type of lattice theory that you yeah, so it's called the uh, ran random spanning forests as opposed to random spanning trees. There is a way, uh, I think it will become clearer how you handle this lattice theory. That was a big uh, initial story from this Carancholo, the whole paper. Uh, and that theory is actually a certain limit, formal limit of the POTS model. It's called the zero state POTS model. So one, uh, one thing that we already noticed back in 2015 and they noticed much earlier is that, uh, that if you take this, there, there is an approach to POTS model in six minus epsilon dimensions due to Zia and Wallace, also back from the 70s and early 80s, it just gives some kind of cubic interactions. And these E's are just the uh, coordinates for the vertices of n dimensional tetrahedron. So they develop uh, epsilon expansions for scaling dimensions. And we noticed that these uh, numbers we get in our OSP theory exactly match that theory for the zero state POTS model. In other words, order by order and perturbation theory this OSP12 approach is a bit like it flushes out the formal zero state POTS limit. I mean, the zero state POTS model is a bit of a formal limit, and but we really do a, a calculation. And so in some sense, this cubic OSP12 theory seems to provide the definition of this formal zero state limit of the POTS model. That's one, one thing. And, uh, and uh, just thinking a bit more about the lattice model that, uh, that people play with uh, or work with, uh, it's just like uh, continuing uh, the sphere to, to the hyperboloid. So you have this uh, weight for each nearest neighbor site. You solve for the sigma, pick one solution, and, uh, and this dot product is just minus sigma x, sigma y, and then the theta theta bar terms. So you include this for each, let, each link, okay, on the lattice. And then the, all the integrations are Grassmann integrations. You no longer, because you eliminated the sigma by a constraint, and then you can devise graphical rules for the Grassmann integrations. I mean, they're a little bit complicated, but for the case of M equal one, they were basically worked out in this paper by Rachel Jacobson, Solars, Salcal, and Spartiello. And they're very interesting rules. They give a very simple set of instructions of how you build uh, these uh, random forests and the lattice. So here is a, an example of a random forest. I mean, it's essentially, you have some quadratic weight for Grassmann variables, and then you insert thetas and theta bars. 
and figure out how to do the beta integrals using standard rules. So, uh, but the spanning force apparently can be simulated on a lattice with very good precision. And this was done already years ago in this paper by Dan Garoni and Sokol in three, four, and five dimensions. And they obtained some numbers. And these numbers that, that appeared in my paper yesterday are extremely close. The, that is sort of the one with news. And I didn't even use the full all the known terms in epsilon expansion, because by now people even know the five loops. <laughs> so they can even be improved a bit in precision, but all of them are very close. So, so that's uh, just another non-rigorous, but numerical sort of uh, vote of confidence in this proposal that this cubic OSP one to approach is sensible. Okay, so, so now I'm, uh, oops, oh, no, I still have a bit of time. Okay, so now what is the, this in some sense just uh, uh, largely what we knew back in 2015, but I think we understood much better from uh, talking to Roland and Tom, what is the difference between this hyperbolic space model and this sphere model? and why it's important to keep this hyperbolic model asymptotically free and equal to some. I think all of that, at least I understood much better. But now, what about say OSP14? What can, can we say anything about that? And here is basically a proposal similar to the one that, that we made for OSP12. And in a nutshell, the story is extremely simple. I mean, essentially, instead of the cubic theory, you have to go to the fifth order theory. Uh, and the, re the reason is almost trivial. I already explained why it can't be a cubic theory, because if you expand, if you take the theory with two pairs of thetas, theta, theta bar, and start expanding the cubic term to this uh, sigma square to the three halves, you're stuck with this one over sigma because the this terms uh, theta theta bar. Uh, there is a quartic term that appears. But if you make this five halves, then there will be sigma to the fifth, sigma cube times this, and then sigma times this. And there won't be any negative power of sigma. So you can exp you can certainly expect to find this enhanced OSP14 symmetry starting with the sigma to the fifth type interaction. Uh, almost something you can explain on the level of high school algebra, but this is, uh, was not clear to me at all back then, uh, back a few years ago. Uh, and then, uh, so I tried this. The weird thing is that uh, the upper critical dimension of the quintic theory is 10 thirds. And you can say, this is, uh, how can I be working near 10 thirds dimensions? But, but it's actually fine. And the people have already done this uh, long ago. And in particular, what was very useful for me is the paper by John Gracie, who developed, he took essentially this kind of theory but instead of theta, theta bar, he had the OM symmetric model. It was partly inspired by what we were doing, but anyways, he had these formulas. Yes. Can you look at a quartic theory, which is the Palmer rule? Yeah, I think the quartic theory, of course, that's the first guess, but it, it does not have, so it will not match up to this hyperbolic uh, model because it has an extra D2 symmetry or one thing. I mean, that, that is actually one of the doubts that people had all along. Like why, why don't we, why isn't the upper critical dimension of this OSP124 rather than six? And it's all hung up on this extra Z2. But, but there is very strong evidence from different kinds that it's really, you can go above four and find non-trivial exponents. 
So apparently what happens is that if you really push, start with this hyperbolic sigma model and push it towards four dimensions, it does not become weakly coupled. Uh, so it's not the upper critical dimension, and that's why we had to go to the cubic one. And similarly here, so I think there will be, it's always these odd powers somehow that match on to the hyperbolic models because we're really not on the super sphere, we're on the super hyperbola. Okay, so let's just start with this quantic theory. Uh, there are three couplings here uh, with linear and sigma, cubic and sigma, and uh, quintic and sigma. And miraculously, I could read off, I could take great, uh, some obscure paper by John Gracie, who is a big fan of these higher loop calculations. He did them for ON instead of SP uh, to M. But then I just took his ON formula and plugged in n equal minus four and found the beta functions and the anomalous dimensions. And very as a very nice uh, check, it all worked. And I really did find the OSP14 invariant theory, which meant that the Gs were appearing in fixed ratios to make this combination basically exactly of this form with the five halves power. Uh, okay, and then there, were, there was the, uh, at this point, one can develop the 10 thirds minus epsilon expansion for delta sigma and delta theta. So the proposal, therefore, is that for the, this H04 model, you can go up to 10 thirds in dimension, and beyond that, it just becomes a free, you know, Gaussian theory. Uh, so let's look at the numbers. The correction uh, actually is very small. So what you find uh, is that the, at this, so, so what's very nice about 10 thirds is that it's only one third bigger than three. So t equal three is still a non-trivial CFT, but it appears to be very weakly coupled, like numerically. And in particular, the one loop uh, dimension is like 0.499. If you just plug in epsilon equal to one third, uh, all definitely numerically not distinguishable from, from the free field. But when I try to do two sided pate, putting an input from two plus epsilon, then it dropped a little. So, one thing that's pretty clear is uh, we don't know very well what it is, and it would help to do a two-loop calculation in this uh, complicated quintic theory. Hopefully this will be done one day. I'm not expecting it. It's not imminent. But at least the existence of this uh, new critical uh, model seems fairly clear. And then the one remaining question is, can, can this be somehow compared with lattice Monte Carlo similar to the spanning forest? Uh, and that hopefully can also be tried. Okay, so are there any questions? Or... Okay, so let me uh, then conclude. So, so I discussed the UV complete description of this metastable CFT between four and six dimensions, uh, where scaling dimensions have non perturbatively small imaginary parts, which however can be very rapidly decreased as n goes above say 500 and become extremely tiny. Then I also discussed a family of cubic SP2M invariant theories, which are similar in spirit to Michael Fisher's description of the Yang universality class near its upper critical dimension six. I think all of these theories have upper critical dimension equal to six. And the very special case of them is the uh, OSP12 cubic theory, which appears to describe the, this critical zero state POTS model or random spanning forests in, for D between 
two and six. And then uh, in this most recent work, there is a proposal about OSP1 2M symmetric fixed points, which require even higher power interactions like fifth, seventh, ninth. And the fifth one is particularly interesting because it still leaves room uh, for a three dimensional interesting model uh, with epsilon expansion approximates new critical exponents in, in D equal three. As I mentioned, in D equal two, all of these series become massive. So D equal two is out, just as in the usual ON sigma model. Uh, but D equal three would be the one to, to focus on here. Uh, while for OSP one six and higher, there is no actual uh, physical standard dimension uh, where this theory would work. But then there are these, uh, these non-local versions uh, that, uh, that many people explore where, where all of this can also be done with, with the, instead of D sigma squared type kinetic term, just taking a bilocal one, like sigma of X, sigma of Y over X minus Y to some power. So if this can also be studied for such by local theories. Okay, thank you very much. I have, I have a question. These OSP models are related to ON models with negative energy. Right, this is the, the, the story. Yeah, yeah. So, from the sigma model point of view, this o, uh, OSP12 is like, yeah, it's like O1 minus 2M. It's you count the anti commuting ones with a minus sign. But indeed, like when, for example, when we look at what happens in two dimensions, we, for that one, we took n equal to minus one. And that's how we determine this, this uh, epsilon expansion. So, for example, the last thing you said, uh, the upper critical dimension is 10 over 3 applies to the O minus 3. Yeah, the, yeah, the O minus 3 one. Right. Yeah, at least perturbatively, it's like O minus 3, but then one has to worry about these subtle Z2s and uh, whether it's a sphere or half of a sphere. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty convinced by this proposal that you really have to work on half of a sphere or a herbaloid because then everything matches up very nicely. And, uh, and actually the model is very well defined from the point of view of this lattice system. You just plug in one solution for the sigma, you completely eliminate uh, all the bosonic variables, and you just have some kind of quartic model for anti-commuting these theta fields. Basically, it's 2G continuum action is like D theta, D theta bar, plus theta, theta bar, D theta, D theta bar. Very nice, simple theory. That's for OSP12. And you can just compute. You can do RG for this theory as was done in these uh, recent papers by Bauer Schmidt and collaborators. And they are asymptotically free in D equal two for the right choice of uh, sign of, of G squared. Yeah, it's somehow very important to choose this negative G squared because if G squared is positive, then it doesn't fly. And I think that's related to why in four dimensions there is no critical behavior somehow. That, but these are all still like, it all needs to be sort of how tightened, but, but that's, that's the, the picture that's emerged for, for the OSP12 case. Is it possible to have models with OSP and slash 2M 
yeah. symmetry by yeah. having more commuting scalars or yeah i think definitely there is in yeah usually for example if you take osp uh, three slash four m there is this perturbatively the, a pair of commuting scalars will everywhere cancel a pair of anti-commuting scalars so in all perturbation calculations they will just cancel out and it will be equivalent to osp1 slash 2. the much harder question is what happens with say osp2 2 4 something uh, yeah, when you have instead of the uh, one, you will have a two. Then, then the whole story changes. So, so the ones where where the first uh, one is one or three or five, I think we pretty much will then understand following this story. So, if the first number is smaller than the second number, then it's a equivalent to always be want something mm -hmm. right right if it's like an yeah 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 maybe. question are, are theories with negative uh, coupling constants in front of positive powers to some extent potentially describing metastable states in terms of lattice uh, models I think for these, because these are just thetas and theta bars, there will not be instability, I think. I was talking about real uh, uh, fields with negative lambda. Oh, just for, for commuting fields, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in, in this model where, where there is only um, the, the anti commuting dynamical mm -hmm. fields. Then yeah, no, then, then it's something else, yes. Thank you. And then I, either sign is okay, and I think uh, the sign that's preferable is the one that keeps uh, that really keeps the correspondence to O minus one and makes the model mass uh, makes it flow to a massive phase in two D, mm -hmm. and that's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think the perturb the non perturbative stability is related to the fact that in six minus epsilon the g's are purely imaginary, so you're not scared of the sigma q. You you just will oscillate wildly. Is there any sort of practical proof of the, this like? The fact that FP2M is the same as O minus M. Uh, o minus M. Like, it seems kind of miraculous. Yeah, from the point of view of performing any kind of perturbative calculation, I think it's pretty clear. I, I'm not an expert. I, there may be like a fully non perturbative proof. But, uh... You didn't have a way to argue it from the lattice point of view? Wasn't that you wrote something at some point that looked like it was some lattice argument? Oh, much more number turbative. Yeah, let's see where, where did they do this? <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, like even here? Yeah. Yeah, well, this this is here, this is just a prescription for how to work with uh, well, P one sub because there is only one sigma. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, I think. But, but from the point of view of the lattice model, there is a big difference, right, between the anti-commuting ones and commuting ones. Because uh, the commute, the you know, the Grassmann integrals are not the same as. Uh, you know, for example, you can expand to all orders in the exponent in the, not in the commuting model, but the expansion will terminate in the Grassmann model. One thing that I'm completely sure of is that when you, whenever you look at, for example, at this type of, uh, let's just go back to the cubic theory. 
right? Uh, so initially we looked at say sigma phi phi. Uh, and you always have these insertions of bubbles uh, and these bubbles will count with the opposite sign for the theta theta bar as compared to phi phi. So, it, and this explains why the beta functions are literally like continuation from n to minus n. But may, maybe it's known to experts why, why these models really, well, you can just say this model defines the ON model for negative. <laughs> I mean, this is, right, this model makes perfect sense. Well, on the lattice, the ON model, you can define it for negative N. Right. Yeah, yeah, variables. like using the Grassmann variables. No, but even even like there's this loop model formulation. That uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Negative. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think I definitely I think a lot is known about these continuations. But I'm I'm not so much interested in continuing to negative, and I'm more interested in taking just some model that contains thetas and theta bars, but is a perfectly well-defined model, rather than some totally formal continuation say of the POTS formula to Q equals zero, which, because they start with tetrahedra. So their formula makes sense for say three and higher dimensions. And then, so this seems to be the definition of that. Any other questions? All right, then let's uh, thank Igor again for a wonderful talk.